That's one of the things that's really characteristic of working class jobs, I think, much more so than more intellectually complicated, abstract jobs. You, one of the things you, you have to be, you have to be a, a good person to be around to do well at a working class job. Because the jobs themselves are quite difficult, they're physically strenuous, they're demanding, and the payoff for that in part is the, is, can be the camaraderie that emerges as a consequence of the shared enterprise. And that can make those jobs extremely worthwhile. You can make very, very good friends in a, in a, in a working class environment. And it's also very frequently the case that those working class environments are characterized by an extremely high level of sophisticated humor, is that they run on like derisive play. And it's one of the things I really liked about the restaurant is people are always playing tricks on each other and making jokes and, you know, and, and, and have, having a kind of dark fun and everyone was participating in that. And it was certainly the case. I had a lot of working class jobs from the time I was 14 till the time I was about 25, I would say. And it was definitely the case that that ethos of harsh play. When I worked at this railway crew in Northern Saskatchewan in the summer one year and uh, I, I was a what the hell they call it a peanut pounder I think that was my job I had to I had this thing that looked like a lead tin can on the end of a stick and the, I followed this machine that went down the tracks and laid down the plates that rails fit in and there'd be a hole that was drilled into the plate and then these things called peanuts held the plate in place so that someone could come, come along and then spike the plate into place. And the guy in front of me would drop this little wooden uh, dowel, which kind of looked like a peanut, hence the name, into the hole to hold the plate solid. And I would whack it with this lead can on the end of a stick. And that's what I did all day was just this for like 16 hours out in the hot sun. And uh, I did that for months. And it was an interesting place to to begin working at. I write about this a bit in, in Beyond Order. I believe it's in Beyond Order. Um, because there was an initiation ceremony that went along with the, with, the, uh, with the job. So when I first showed up at the, on the crew, no one was particularly friendly. It was all men. And there were rough guys. Like a lot of them were native guys from, from Cree, Cree Indian guys from Saskatchewan. A lot of them had been in prison. They were rough guys, and they weren't that friendly if you were new. And they gave you a rough time. So everybody who came on board and the crew got a stupid nickname. Um, mine was Howdy Doody, which was this red-headed puppet from freckled puppet with big ears from the 1950s. And uh, I asked one guy why he called me Howdy Doody. And he said, because you look nothing like him, which <laughs> I thought was an extremely witty answer, you know, a very funny answer. And anyways, it was a bit of a derogatory nickname. And uh, part of it was, it was delivered to see if you had enough of a sense of humor to accept it without getting all, you know, narcissistically puffed up and irritable about it. And so it got shortened eventually to Howdy, which was a lot better because there was kind of a cowboy chic thing going on with that. And that was a lot better. And, uh, but there was this period where you got ribbed a lot, two weeks about, and if you didn't collapse under the weight of the teasing, then, and you did your damn job, and you know, you're reasonably entertaining to be around, then the doors opened and you were now part of the crew. There was one guy there, I wrote about him, Lunch Bucket was his name, that was his nickname, <laughs> Lunch Bucket. He showed up on the crew, with a lunch bucket, and that was a bad idea. It was obvious that his mum had packed it, and you don't want to say, you don't want to show up to a work crew of ex-cons with a lunch bucket that your mum packed. It's a bad look, and so he was called Lunch Bucket from day one, and he was a pretty touchy guy and pretty narcissistic, and people didn't like him very much, and he was tested a lot, and the testing started out with people just throwing pebbles at him. So he was, the crew would stretch out about a quarter of a mile across the 
a line as we were working on the tracks and Lunch Bucket would be doing whatever job he had and the, the game was to see if he could bounce a pebble off Lunch Bucket's helmet and so he'd be working and these pebbles would be flying out of God only knows where because people didn't make it obvious and you know it was a it was a, a score for your mates if you bounced a pebble off Lunch Bucket's helmet and he did not take to that well and <laughs> the pebbles got larger as the days progressed and eventually he was driven off and it was because he didn't subjugate himself properly to the multi-dimensional discipline of the crew you know because he wasn't he wasn't a good guy to have around he couldn't take a ribbing he didn't have a sense of humor he wasn't able to contribute to the game that was being played socially well these men were doing what was pretty tedious and difficult work like we were literally out in the hot sun for 16 hours at a stretch and it was rather mind-numbing work and somewhat physically demanding the the peanut pounding wasn't particularly difficult but the the state the spike pounding was and and you need some camaraderie in those positions so that your life is rendered maybe not just tolerable but even enjoyable in in principle and so you're playing a multi-dimensional game and if you're willing to subjugate yourself to that discipline then you learn how to play that game and if you get good at that then that's a portable skill you might ask yourself well what are you doing when you when you work as hard as you possibly can on at least one thing is that you're 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 molding yourself into someone who can aim at something and move forward with efficiency and skill and maybe if you're doing that extraordinarily well you're not only molding yourself into someone who can aim at something and move towards it with efficiency and skill but you can do that at the same time that you're helping other people around you do that right so you can think about this imagine you're a good athlete on a team and you might say well what does it mean to be a good athlete and you might say well I'm, I'm, I'm a soccer player a football player and I'm, I'm great at, at uh, I'm a top scorer and you might say well that's enough to make you a great athlete and the truth is that's actually not enough to make you a great athlete because you need to have the skill whatever the skill might be and high level skill is of course extremely desirable in relationship to the goal but you also have to be um, a, a good let's say a good sport and that's a rather trivial description for something that's actually quite a profound moral accomplishment so if you're not only a highly skilled athlete in the technical sense but you're a good sport it means that while you practice your skill whatever that is you also elevate the ability of all your teammates to 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 make their skill manifest and also to improve their skill and you do that simultaneously right and that's that's a high level of athletic ethos is your your good athlete and your good team player and the and the union of those two things might make you something approximating a good person and that's transportable i think part of the reason that we admire sports heroes when they're sports heroes in the truest sense is because if they are ritual models of emulation in relationship to the development of high level skill and they're also admirable team players in the highest sense then they actually are something approximating admirable citizens